on January the 26th, 2023, in council chambers at 10 a.m. Um, could I have a, an approval, please, of the agenda? Please. Councilor King, Councilor Chong, all in favor. Thank you. So <laughs> before we start, I'm just going to say that this is not a public meeting. This is a special open meeting, so um, this will just be dealt with by the people who are sitting at this table. And certainly we encourage people to come and um, and listen to our meetings, but they are not, it's not open to the public. So there will be no interaction with anybody who is um, is sitting at, not at the table. Okay, just wanted to make that, that clear. And first of all, we will, we're looking at the Town of Missouri Zoning Bylaw, Fort Shore and Lake Zoning Bylaw, and Short-Term Rentals Policy Program Recommendation. And we have Brittany Puddle from uh, Urban Systems. So welcome, Brittany, and please go ahead. Okay, thank you for having me today. And I'm also joined by my, by my colleague, Maxine, the local here at Bassett, uh, who's also a client with Urban Systems. Uh, so we did provide some slides. If we can get those up on the screen, that would be awesome. And just, just one quick thing, um, Madam Mayor, and yep. um, to everyone else, welcome everybody, of course, and welcome our friends from Urban Systems. Um, I'm hoping that, of course, at the end, we will talk about the upcoming public sessions and when we're going to go online, live, and when our online surveys will open, all that kind of stuff, just in case anybody is watching that can't stay for the whole time. Not a problem. That will be happening at the end, so come on back in and check back in. I don't know if you can just ask you to share the mic on. I think so. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I speak into it. Yes. Thank you. Everybody needs to do that so we can all support each other. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for having uh, us back today. All thanks, so if you recall, uh, about a month ago, we kicked off this project, this very important project to look at the zoning bylaw, the foreshore and lake zoning bylaw and the short-term rental policy program recommendations. Uh, so we won't be providing a context on those projects today since we did that a month ago. Um, you would have received an agenda from us beforehand. You'll see that there's quite a few things that we have to get through today that we would like your direction on. So I'm going to jump right in. Figure out how to make this advance. So I just press the middle button. Yes, you should just uh, maybe point it at uh, this point that way. Point it this way. You know, it should really be here. Oh, no, that's fine. I'll just move it. Okay. I can move this over one. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll go over the agenda first before we dive in here. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is a bit of a round table um, exercise. Um, if you recall from taking a look at the agenda, we had asked each of you to think about what are your top three sort of priorities uh, or items that you would like to engage with the public on um, for these projects. So we're going to go around and ask uh, each counselor to and the mayor to state uh, what those top three priorities are and we're going to make note of those. Then we'll get into some more uh, discussion that's focused on the zoning bylaw. You'll see we have a number of topics there that we'd like to discuss. Um, we can go to the next slide, Brianne. Sorry. Uh, then we're also going to spend some time to talk about fortune rentals. And then we have a couple of items that we'd like to discuss about the foreshore and the zoning bylaw as well. And then to wrap things up, we will go over what our next steps for this project are, which is where we'll be highlighting uh, all of the community engagement that we have coming up that Gina um, just met, mentioned. Okay, so first we'll start off with the uh, round table discussion. If you can go to the next slide, too. perfect. So we have this question about what are the top three topics or priority areas related to zoning, foreshore and lake zoning, and short term rentals uh, on which council would like us to seek public input as part of the community engagement process? 
So maybe I will start with Councillor Chong. Okay. And Brent is going to write down your top three priorities and we'll go around to each councillor. Uh, good. Um, I didn't know how specific we need to go, but I think uh, the top one is going to be STR to show term some sort of regu regulation and more, more clarity. Um, and then number two would probably be um, addressing parking in the downtown core. And because uh, we looked at the, the boundaries of that one by law on Tuesday. Okay. Yes, it's a, it's a reduced parking area that's identified in the zoning bottle. We've discussed that previously. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing to look at for I sure. Didn't quite make sense. And then um, this one's really general. In terms of the four door, personally, I just want a bit more clarity because I'm, I'm a little confused as to who controls what, who owns what, what can we do, what can we do, what's been going on so far, and steps as to how we can remediate all, all of that in terms of the buildings and whatnot. Thank you, Yes, well, I have some of the same concerns. So at least we're all thinking on the same on the same page here. One is the town center area zoning 1085 bylaw, which was um, done in 1998. And I, I do think that we need to have a look at that one again, which is basically what uh, Councillor Chong said about the parking in the downtown area. That's the reason. Um, short term rentals uh, is obviously another big concern, um, licensing requirements and um, and who should have them and and whether, you know, it's, it's a big topic. So who can have them and do you have to live in the house to have them? Do you have to live in town? How many do we need? That type of thing. And which zoning areas should we have them? And the third is the lake zoning um, bylaw. Uh, I'm concerned about safety issues, um, the docks, the buoys that are um, out in front, and um, and I think we need to put in some concerns about safety for not only swimmers, but boaters and kayakers and uh, that type of thing. Those are my three. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to start with Councillor Chong. Oh, sorry, I, I'm still learning. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure how this would be wanted. So I'll do short term rent NTRs, um, zoning as a whole. That's what I'm doing by myself and uh, for short. Okay. I'll see. <laughs> I'll see. Yeah, <laughs> That's good. Let's see. I could just three different ones. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> the accessory uh, dwelling unit. Okay, good one. When you talk about service commercial uses, what are you referring to? So, service commercial uses are things that are services offered for sale to the public. Um, or it can also mean things like a gas station, a car wash, um, things where you're not usually purchasing a good per se, but you're purchasing a service instead. So sometimes those we also find in light industrial areas as well, um, but you, they're not usually things that you would want to see in a downtown core. Okay. You can know. Okay. <laughs> and then the short term rent. Okay. And I work, this was it for counselors. There's no counselors going on the line, no, correct? No. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then looking at this list that we have here, I'd now like you to identify what are the top three things from this list. It looks like we have some consensus already on short term rentals, parking in downtown, and uh, for sure having some clarity over how that program works. Um, but now that you've all had a chance to go around and listen to what each other has said, looking at this list as a whole, do you agree with those three things that you most commonly identified as being the top three? Or do you think that there's anything else that came up there or anything that's missing? 
For, when you talk about four shores, I can include the buoys or just the uh, four shore? Correct, it will include the buoys. But it does both at the same time. Correct. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Those look like the top three. Okay. Great. That was very easy then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think as well, today we're going to be talking about all three of those things and seeking your direction on some of those items uh, to give us a sense of where council is currently at pertaining to these things and how we might want to craft the questions that we're going to be asking the public when we go up to them in a couple of weeks here. So that's what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of the, of the discussion. So we can move right into that. Um, so the first one of grant is just want to keep advancing to the zoning bylaw. Perfect. And then if you want to click again as well, perfect. Okay, so we have a C8 zone um, in the existing zoning bylaw, and that allows for service uh, commercial uses. And so one thing that we wanted to flag for council here is that some of the uses that are currently listed as permitted uses in the service commercial zone may not really fit in with what we classify as a service commercial use. So something that we're going to be looking at um, as part of this process is considering does it make sense to include some of these uh, service commercial type uses within this zone still, or does it make sense to move them to another zone? So for example, there's a few uses there that maybe could be better suited to light industrial. Um, it's okay to keep some of those things in a service commercial zone, but it could also belong in the light industrial zone. And then there's also the fire hall, police station, and other public utility type uses. Um, sometimes we see those in an institutional zone uh, in other communities and maybe not in a service commercial zone. So that's one thing that we'll be thinking about as we move forward uh, in updating the bylaw. Just, just um, to that point, um, um, a good example of a service commercial area that has been a, an area that's been identified in the previous OCP and the current OCP as being ideal for service or highway commercial uses is the area we see between 51st and Lakeshore Drive in that area there that we just actually spoke about, um, about um, on Tuesday. Um, it's a great idea even to think about, and again, we're just thinking about ideas here, that other things that you might want to include in the service commercial area would be things like craft brewery or distillery, um, those kind of things might also be suitable for that particular area. So we need to think about, um, as we work through this, this process, um, areas where, you know, service commercial uses would be seen, you know, um, so that's, a, and, and that stems true with pretty much every zone. So where do we have those kind of uses now? Is that the kind of uses long term we want to see in these kind of areas? Can I just ask if some of those uses um, are already in a different zone, we're not going to say to them, by the way, um, you need to move. Is there, no. is no. that, so there's just encouraging new? Right. So that's a really good question, Mary McCorda. So if, for example, you want to see some particular uses not in that particular area over the long term, what you would do is you would take that use out of that zone. The use can continue in perpetuity as long as it does not halt for six months or greater. Otherwise, it's considered grandfathered. So let's just say, for example, there's a gas station downtown. But we didn't think that over the long term, service station should be something that's downtown. Um, you would take that out as a permitted use in a C1 zone. And as long as that service station stayed there, whether it was an ESO or a Husky or doesn't matter, it change, can change hands. As long as the use continued, it could continue in perpetuity. It would be considered grandfathered. Thank you. That's what I kind of hoped would happen. Yeah. And and actually, there's one more point. Say you just and again, just as an example, because you don't want anybody to get too worried about anything. We're just talking at this point. Say we were to move to a service commercial type of zoning in that commercial designated area that we talked about over about 51st and Lakeshore Drive. It doesn't mean we wouldn't add more items to the list of the C8 zone and take some of the additional items off of it. If deemed to be appropriate. So 
it would just be for somebody who was coming to town wanting to open up a business that we would um, steer them to the correct zone. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Brianna, if you actually just want to advance ahead two more slides, I have a figure showing the area that Gina's talking about. Well, for look at that. So <laughs> this is it here. So it's currently zone M3, which is special industrial, um, which doesn't really make sense for what's going on there and also what the OCP direction is, because in the OCP, this area is designated as general commercial, not as industrial. Um, and part of the zoning bylaw update as well is to try to align the zones as much as we can with the direction that the OCP is providing to or what we would like to see there in the future. So this area is one that we're going to be looking at as well and most likely uh, rezoning those properties to, to C8 from M3. I want to go back. <laughs> Perfect. You want C1 or C1? Uh, C1 now, thank, thank you. So um, dissimilarly to the C8 zone, there's a few uh, permitted uses identified in the C1 downtown commercial um, zone that we might consider changing some of the permitted uses in there. So if you click again, Brianne, it will bring up some that are underlined. Um, so the same concept, um, as Gina mentioned, if there's something existing that falls within these permitted uses already, then it will just continue as a legal non-conforming use or it will be grandfathered in. But moving forward, we probably don't want to be encouraging things like an automotive repair shop in the downtown or a car wash or a, a storage warehouse, those sort of things that would be better suited to other areas so we can ensure that we're having some more pedestrian oriented type uses in our downtown that are aligning with the intent of the OCP for the direction that it provides on the town center, uh, as well as the town center uh, plan too. So those are some things that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at what we're permitting in the downtown. So I just wanted to flag this more for council's information that we'll be doing a similar exercise for all the zones to see if the permitted uses list uh, makes sense, but these two were ones that stood out to us kind of right away. That's a really good point. Thank you, Brittany. And just um, again, to add to that, uh, thank you, Mary, for us through the chair. Um, the point that Brittany makes about a pedestrian oriented uses is really key because again, we we're talking about parking downtown. We're talking about um, residential uses downtown. And so we should be talking about other uses downtown that are pedestrian oriented rather than drawing more vehicles, for example, down to an auto repair shop downtown when they could be going to say a service commercial area or a light industrial area. They, those kind of uses that encourage you to bring your vehicle downtown, you know, other than obviously visiting um, a grocery store, for example, or something to that effect um you know we, we you know we need to think about the bigger picture right so mm -hmm. thank you Brittany thanks Gina are there any uh, general questions or comments about what we just discussed on C1 or C8 at this point seems pretty straightforward I think it sounds great okay perfect let's continue on then to the back there hens so this is a uh, somewhat new concept to uh, the town and something that other communities are starting to explore uh, because of the challenges that our communities across the province are experiencing in relation to food security. So backyard hens is one um, uh, avenue that communities are exploring for how we can encourage people to grow or raise their own food, um, depending on what that looks like in terms of hens. And so we're seeing uh, communities permitting these in through their zoning bylaws as a, an accessory uh, residential use. Um, and we're also seeing them through things like animal control bylaws too. So not always in the zoning bylaw, um, but essentially in the definition, we want to be very clear that um, a backyard hen is a hen, not a rooster. <laughs> We don't want to have roosters uh, in downtown facilities waking up people at uh, the crack of dawn every day. And so that's something that we would be quite clear about if we do want to pursue um, permitting backyard hens uh, anywhere in the studies. 
Um, and you can also regulate other aspects of them as well. So thinking about how large the coop needs to be, um, how close to your lot lines you can have it, how close to your, the house or the principal building that you can have the coop as well, uh, how many that you can have. So we did a little bit of a scan in other communities and saw that that number really ranged from two to six hens per property. Um, and then also what zones that they're permitted in. So most, most often we're seeing them permitted in more rural or uh, residential zones um, as well. We're not really seeing them permitted in things like commercial zones or um, industrial zones, but that is something that could be explored too. If a business wants to have some backyard hens, um, if you want to permit that, that could be an option as well. We're, we're completely open to hearing uh, your opinion on this matter. So that brings me to the next slide then. Uh, to have some discussion with council about would you like to permit backyard hens uh, as an accessory use? And if you do, where? So go ahead. Yeah, I could support it, but I guess it would identify in kind of specific areas. I don't know if we really have any rural area. The town is so small, and I couldn't see them like a block over from the main street residential. But I think moving forward, like you mentioned about people bringing their own food or eggs becomes a, a positive down the road in the long term. So I could support them, but have to definitely identify locations for sure. I think some of the small lots that we have in town are probably not a good place to have um, hens because I don't think we've got enough of a yard to support that. Um, but Certainly, it's one of the questions that's been asked. Um, so we know that there are people that would like to um, to have this. Um, so in a dense urban setting, um, I think it might be a bit tricky. But certainly, in some of the the um, C one zones and going or the R one zones, um, they might be perfectly all right. Provided you have enough room, and would it require your neighbors to weigh in on this? Is that the idea or? <laughs> well, Mayor, that's a, that is up to council's discretion. Um, that is something that you could do as part of, uh, you can make a certain approval process to have them beforehand, or you could just outright perform in the bylaw. So that's up to council's discretion to determine they'd like to follow procedure. And what about other animals? Well, that's a good Bunnies question. Or, you know, I don't know what other animal people might keep other than dogs and cats. Thank you, Mayor Burkhoff. But some people expressed an interest in having goats, baby goats, and small mini goats and pygmy goats. <clears throat> Which I think is a fantastic idea because we can use a button. But um, with respect to the hens and other municipalities I've worked with, um, they have restricted them, say, to like, say, for example, as you mentioned, R1 lot. Yeah. Which has a you know a certain lot size, which is obviously larger than you'd see up at Meadow Arc or in the R two zones uh, for the small single family homes. The other restriction that I've seen in, imposed is um, you have to have x square meters of actual open space because a lot of people might be in an R one zone, but they've got you know a shed and a trailer, and they've basically got a tiny little box like this. They're gonna put the hands in. So they need to have this amount of space plus a group of X size. And there's lots of examples we could um, draw from as we go through the process. At this point, we're just wondering if council has an interest in exploring this idea. Actually, yeah, it's great. What do you think? I I support it with um with this other um, zoned areas. Um and then have some stipulations where you need to have a certain amount of green space mm -hmm. and then also not completely hidden away from the view, but aesthetically pleasing. Not in the front yard. <laughs> exactly. I think is uh mm -hmm. is key. Um but aside from that, I think yeah, I think it's it's worth exploring. I think so too. Yeah. And then also having parameters because you don't want that slippery slope where we allow a certain breed of goats and then let's go well, we have these goats they're goats oh yeah and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger and they go level pigs yeah yeah 
I think you need to have specific defined which the size or however you want to do that. We'll explore that. So are you open enough for to explore the idea of votes also? Or just I, I did suggest it because it has been brought to my attention previously. Yeah, for sure. There'd be a lot of interest in votes around town. <laughs> Exploring the idea doesn't mean we have to approve. No, I know. I, I, right. I, right. But that's what I want. Or are we going to explore goats that belong with hens? That's the question. And or could you not go with no hens? And can we look at other animals? And I'm sure that that's been brought up in other areas. Can we look and see what other um, jurisdictions are doing and which animals sure. they yeah. uh, allow for what reason sure. and which zoning? <laughs> <laughs> well, we encourage people to have backyard gardens and grow their own tomatoes and that type of thing. So um, as long as this is not a noise issue, that could be part of it too, right? Yes, I think smell so, is a big one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, like right. pigs, sorry, um, Mayor and Council, like pigs are one thing you probably don't want yeah. to consider, yeah. but goats are typically on the lower end of the odor scale <laughs> <laughs> and uh, noise scale. So those and rabbits might be <laughs> the others that we use for, or ducks maybe too. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, let's look at what other people want to put it in. Absolutely. Yeah. I know Franklin likes doing this animal research, so <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I, I just want to say, Mayor McGrath, that I've been waiting five years uh, for this subject to be broached. And um, I feel like I've well rounded my career now because I've been through this in every municipality that I've been in. And there's been, as you know, a few. So, so we're not we, suggesting that we allow them in white sands, right? Uh, it won't matter to me after May. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Um, no, I would think not in a mobile no, family. No. no. Or even in a duplex. I mean, no, is that no, that no, would, might not that work either. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, typically we've only seen them permitted in single detached residential type yeah. areas. No, I, I've, I've never seen them permitted in multi family before. Okay. So, highly unlikely, but that's what <laughs> we'll be suggesting. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's carry on to the next topic then of uh, off street parking for downtown, which was a topic that you identified as a priority. So that's great. So as you can see on this figure here, this is largely the area that's identified as, as downtown and in your zoning bylaw and also the official community plan. And so currently in the zoning bylaw, there are different uh, parking requirements identified for any multi-residential um, uses that are occurring within the boundaries of that red area. So the bylaw permits one space per dwelling unit or requires a minimum of one parking space per dwelling unit for any multifamily occurring within those boundaries. Outside of those boundaries, if you have multifamily, you're required to have 1.75 spaces per dwelling unit. So I believe the context of this would be to encourage people to walk or bike more and drive less if you're living uh, within the downtown. And so the question that we'd like to pose uh, to council today is, do you think that these boundaries uh, still makes sense because this parking requirement still makes sense. Um, is is a different parking requirement perhaps necessary for this area? Or another option as well to consider is if that one space per dwelling unit is working well for downtown and you think it may be beneficial to encourage less parking uh, spaces for all multifamily within the town, do we also want to lower the parking standard for other multifamily uh, uses that are occurring outside of the downtown too? So a few different things to, to consider here uh, for council on this topic. So one thing that, that comes to my mind is that um, that normally, well not normally, and I, I don't know what normal is these days, but um, there Many families, if there's two people, they have two cars. So um, if you're in this area and you're only required to have one space, 
what happens to your second car or your trailer or your boat or, you know, that type of thing that people often have. And we know that people that have, in some areas that have um, a two-car garage also need extra parking because their garage is filled up with other things. So it um, it can be a little tricky. And I, mm -hmm. I, I would be a little bit concerned about saying only one parking spot down there. I mean, other than building a parking garage, but you know, that doesn't fit. Um, is that a permitted use <laughs> in that in yes, the downtown area? It, it is. is, okay. Um, and and I know that we're trying to encourage people to um, uh, to walk more, bike more, um, and not always go with their cars. And I get that. But the reality is that many people have more than one vehicle. So we, I think we need to be careful about that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I completely agree. And on the heels of our conversation recently, I did have a, I just asked a few friends where do their visitors park when they come to visit them? And they all said on the road, on the street, street parking. Like, and it didn't matter where they were. Right. So that is just, that is kind of what people, I think that's our, our minds. I think it's everyone's mindset um, has been for generations. So, yeah, I'm not sure how we're going to resolve this one. My question would be, how old is the drawing? 1998. 1998. Seems kind of unique how they go around one little corner spot there and then they just go across. It follows the zoning, downtown zoning. Yeah. So um, the other thing is that this was done in 1998, and I have a feeling that there was quite a few less people living here at that time because um, yeah, you know sure. we we certainly have that yeah. ability to look at it, but I think that there could have been only about 3,000 people here instead of five. Right. And, and if I may say, Mayor Mahardo, I think if we were going to even look at keeping something like this in the bylaw, this they need to be adjusted for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it might be wise to keep it. Maybe the number isn't one. Maybe it's one point two five. Maybe it's one point five. I don't know. I'm just suggesting that if we were going to look at keeping something like this, we might consider we would consider mm -hmm. um, a new map. I, new boundaries. I agree because I'm sure there's lots mm -hmm. of different oh, developments yeah. that have happened since this. Well, I guess would you be coming back and mm -hmm. talking about a new map or just you're happy with this? I mean, to me, it looks like it should be tweaked a bit. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. If we are going to consider leaving something like this in the bylaw, I definitely think we want to consider amending the map. Yeah, okay. And I'm not sure that one is the right number either. No, no I, I mean, I don't know. I'm I just saying. Know. I'm just talking about yeah, the map. Absolutely. Yeah, the details yeah. later. But I think the map should definitely be looked at. Yeah. Well, then my other concern is there are some grandfathered buildings that have additions on them and uh, the parking a lot of parking isn't sufficient and uh, we run into situations where the tenants of, of those buildings are parking in street parking long term which then takes away from other visitor parking and other public use so it's uh, how do we mm -hmm. consolidate that because I mean we can't build additional parking on the lots but at the same time, public parking and sometimes tenants have handicapped needs or disabilities mm -hmm. where you know they need that parking spot. But at the same time, when summer comes or shoulder season and whatnot, there's mm -hmm. one park, one, two, three parking spots on the street that are fully used all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to find a nice compromise. Mm -hmm. I just don't quite know what that looks mm -hmm. like. <laughs> We're great at doing compromises. That's what we have. Yeah. And, yeah. and may I, may I just say, Mayor McGrath, again through the chair, um, you know, we have we have a parking fund that we should really be exploring some options of where to build some additional um, public parking. And of course, um, at some point, we're probably going to explore have to explore the um, opportunity to um, have those two hour parking signs up, um, those kind of things, and. Again, that means more bylaw staff, more. I mean, everything has a snowball effect, as we all know, but 
And we also need to look at parking for um, boats and traders and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's another big issue that we have to deal with. Um, and when people don't find a place to do that, then they park on the street as well. And that is a concern because it often takes up two or three spots for uh, This might be a little beyond the scope of this conversation, but have we explored the idea of metered parking with a pass system like other municipalities? Um, that's a really good question. Thank you, Councilor Chung. Don't. <laughs> Everyone hates it so much. They hate talking about them. Um, when you say explore, has it been discussed? It has been discussed in general, in general way, but not. Um, there was no has been no appetite for exploring it beyond that general conversation. Certainly in Tantic, then that then brought up quite a lot because there are concerns there. People don't like it. They don't want to be able to have to go down to the market and pay for parking. So they have adjustments there. And um, for instance, um, I'm a director at the regional district that the city of Penticton gives me a parking pass, which whenever I'm there for meetings, I need to put in my car so that I don't have to pay at the meters. But um, I know that for the month of December, they didn't, they put covers over all the meters and said, you know, we want to encourage people to come down. So, you know, there's good and bad on that, no, for sure. But it is tricky, and it's certainly a tricky issue in Penticton, which I don't know has 50,000 people or something. And I don't know of any other uh, municipalities around here that have parking meters other than Penticton. Do you know? Um, no, but I could, if you mind, um, I will speak to a town that's a city that's 5,000 people, okay, which is Duncan. So mm -hmm. Duncan is 5,000 people in their downtown, and, and their 5,000 people are downtown, like that is their downtown, and that their, their, their boundaries are very small. The, mm. the city of Duncan, the boundaries are very small, um, and they have, um, they have quite restricted parking on street restricted parking, and the parking commissioners that mm -hmm. uh, go and they will give you tickets. Um, mm -hmm. They're very good at it. Um, and I was surprised that it's that small because, you know, many years ago I went to school there, and at that time it was really, really uh, much bigger than I've ever done. No, well, the, I mean, the, the area is much bigger yeah. than the actual city it's itself, city where in that they have this yeah. restricted parking. And but what they do have is they do have a parking um, area that you can pay for month, daily parking. Okay. Does the summer line have pay parking too? Yes. Yeah. Do they? I wasn't sure. Well, with my my thought process is more so a lot of our mine uh, municipalities take advantage of not take advantage, but monetize the increase in in tourism during those peak seasons. And with the way uh, the example I like to use is in, in Whistler. Of course, we're not Whistler, but mm -hmm. um, I recall being in Park Lawn grocery store and. We're at the point where there's a car with two cameras on top and they just read your license plate mm -hmm. and so he just drives through and uh, so there's no infrastructure where we need the physical parking meters anymore it's all digital mm -hmm. and um i mean we can have it so that locals who, who are residential like permanent residents or full-time residents they're exempt from that that's relatively not a deal but i'm just thinking as another revenue source for the town while also managing our parking issue mm -hmm. as you know one many birds one stone approach mm -hmm. there is a manpower issue there though that somebody yeah. got to drive that vehicle yeah. and, well, and with with manpower if you have a, if we can generate revenue to cover the costs of okay. of that bylaw then you're still in a surplus that's true yeah go ahead mrs Dolphin. i'm only going to caution that sometimes even though it could be considered a revenue mm -hmm. if tickets have to be written there are costs associated with writing those tickets. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's exactly it. Then trying to recoup the money. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a source of revenue, but there's also costs associated with mm -hmm. them writing the tickets and then the enforcement. I think we pass on the meter at this time. <laughs> Just an idea. Exactly. Yeah, they keep them back for sure. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next topic then. <laughs> Still on the topic of parking. Just on the next slide. Okay, perfect. So on this sort of thought about parking for um multi multi-family or multiple unit residential, um would council like to consider requiring a different parking requirement for purpose-built rental housing? And the thought behind this is that uh, parking is expensive to include in multifamily uh, housing. Uh, it's expensive to maintain. And so if we had a lower parking standard required, um, perhaps that would lower the cost of uh, rental housing. So there's something to consider there. But then again, also there's all the side effects or uh, potential challenges that come with having lower standards as well that <laughs> I'll identify now. I, I, I honestly don't like it. I, I, I don't really support that because all you're doing is pushing people under the streets uh, and then there's no room for tourists to park if they come to town, especially if you're talking downtown where you're open to drive people and walking around to see things. Yeah, Crump, I just want to just make one quick point, and it's not neither here nor there in any fashion for or against whatever, just that I want to make a note that um, BC housing projects only will always have surface parking. So, so they won't have a they, they won't have a parkade no. or underbuilding parking. Okay. So that's just their model. So I'm just I'm just um I'm making we're gonna talk a lot more about this in the spring, sure, about housing projects and possible opportunities um within our community. But um so so when we talk about um some rental housing projects that might be supported through BC Housing or CMHC funding, we have to be cognizant of the fact that means a larger parcel. To accommodate um, that um, surface parking. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a question. Um, is there opportunity or is there current uh, uh, process in place uh, where you could look at um, some active transportation storage slash parking that would help offset since also, let's say, it would be, let's say, if the number was 1.75, you'd on like 1.5 plus, let's say, storage for bicycles in a multi family dwelling to kind of offset that as an opportunity there, too. Yep, absolutely. It's actually quite common now for us to see in zoning bylaws requirements for bicycle parking and multi family, as well as in other songs like commercial, industrial to encourage people to bike to work. Um, and you can you can impo impose different types of bike standard parking requirements uh, beyond just the physical spaces to park your bike. You can mm -hmm. also require amenities like showers and lockers as well. Those are just classified as there's class one or class two um, types of bicycle parking spaces. Um, and within those categories, too, they differentiate between secure and unsecure spaces. So those are very common to see in going by loss now. Mm -hmm. And and if I may, thank you, Councillor Federica, to the chair. Um, we do have a provision in our zoning bylaw that some of your parking can be reduced slightly with with bicycle parking included. In a in a, um, an apartment uh, complex, and we have a one that's going on eighty nine mm -hmm. being built. Is there because some of the units are very small? Is there uh, um, a provision for storage rooms in the basement. I know in Vancouver, I, I, that's all I'm, I'm going by. And I wondered if that right. was part of it. So well, thank you um, through the chair, Mayor McCroft. Um, <coughs> people nowadays are less and less likely to include storage facilities mm -hmm. in their buildings because of the land costs and the cost mm -hmm. of construction. So what they have opted for more often is the municipal okay. storage units. So they have a bicycle storage area that maybe holds 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever number of bikes um, and or recreational other um, things like that, kayaks or whatnot, rather than having separate storage lockers for everyone sort of, um, to use the White Sands example, one whole floor on one is, is all storage. Oh, okay. Like it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't do that now. 
But you know, we're looking at smaller units that mm -hmm. um, that are being sure. built because they're more cost effective. Mm -hmm. And so, where do you put all your Christmas stuff? You put it in those rental storage facilities that people have. They're all full. Cool. <laughs> or you don't, you don't have it. <laughs> You don't have that. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, that's true, though. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, that's why we saw Mr. Harper on Tuesday. Yes. For the storage facility, because they're all full oh. there. They're full all the way to Kamloops. I know. So, does that mean that people in his building get first dibs on the storage? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One could be made a deal on that. <laughs> well, Another kind of thought process, as we as we know, the city says it's you know, limited in terms of land. Um, so, how many of these purpose-built rental housing units will like bylaw amendments really apply to for grandfathering all the previous units that are already built? Like realistically speaking, how many? Like, who would this apply to? That's a very good question. So, there's two things that are probably likely to happen. You're going to have more people come in wanting to build purpose-built rental and, or we as a community, the town, will um, look at some of our lands for some purpose-built rentals. I would say, we won't, we've talked about this before, there's not very many parcels left, no. right? So we could look at it on a case-by-case -case basis or, that's what I mean. Like it, it tends to be a case if we make this sweeping amendment and it targets like two developers or two developments, then why don't we just look at it on a case by case basis mm -hmm. and that we can make it more specific to those developments as opposed to having a generalized rule that it affects. Right. So if I may, again mm -hmm. to the chair, um, what is often done is you would have a provision in your parking section of your zoning by that says something defective the let's just use the 1.75 example. So 1.75 parking spaces per unit in a multifamily, this number may be reduced where in zones which are are identified for purpose built rent housing only. Something to that effect you can have. And whatever that reduction is, be it 1.25 or one, you know, not to speak numbers, but sometimes you see it done that way. I think this maybe leads us to the next topic. Um, uh, that's a good uh, idea. About residential rental 10 years on in. Um, because, so before I, I'll explain what this is first. Um, so the local government act a few years ago was amended to give local governments the authority to limit the tenure of multiple unit residential housing to rental only. So purpose built rental. Um, and you can limit this to an entire zone or require a certain percentage of units in a building to be purpose-built um, rental. And so we're seeing some communities now adopting these zones that are only allowing for purpose-built rental housing. So if we were going to apply a specific um, requirement for parking as well, then it would probably only apply to this zone too. So that's something to um, consider as well is if you, oh, maybe go back one slide, Brian. And if you would like to see uh, a new zone that is for purpose built rental only. And I'm just gonna clarify one thing. You can't put a zone in your zoning bylaw without having it attached to a piece of property. So we can't have a zone in there hoping somebody's going to apply to rezone to that zone. We would have to identify a piece of property, if I may say, let's say the Collins property, because it's our property. Um, we could attach a rental 10 years zoning, rental only zoning to that. Or property. you could also have the zone already written up and ready to go for if someone did come forth with an application, then you could rezone the property to this new uh, zone as well. We do have to have a property zone that is a buy model. Yeah. So we would have to, it could be there on our property, but also available to other persons. Yes. Yeah. I go back to Mr. Chong's comment. I don't see how that's moving forward with it. Like the, the one about three properties we're even talking about. 
So it could be looked at as it comes forward, if it ever comes forward. It could be looked at it further when we get to actually drafting the zones to see if we do want to have a uh -huh. rental zone and and we could use our property as an example and discuss it in that time as well. These are lots of options for council to consider and lots of options to discuss with the community. Yeah. I want to waste all your time. No, I, I think it's we do. Uh, it's prudent to have to create rental tenure zones. Um I was more concerned about the the viable parking. Um, because we have specific zones where they can only be rental, like rental mm -hmm. units that would greatly help our housing crisis. Mm -hmm. so I would like to create a new rental zone. Right. Okay, yeah, I agree. You guys okay with that? Yeah, I'm good. So we would want to do this before we, for instance, the palms you recommended. I don't know if you specified that that was one area. So we would want to do this before we allowed building that palm. Is that just an example? Just, just as an example. example. Yeah. Um, the reason, if I may, uh -huh. that I suggested that that would be a good property to attach the zone to is because it's ours. We're not yeah. going to have any conflict with the property owner. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And another thing you might want to consider when this zone is being created is a higher density for that zone than you would permit in R7. So if somebody wanted to rezone their property to rental apartments, they could do so, um, but and they could even get additional units, right? Much is the same as the density bonus so thing. But they would be rental only. Yeah. What about the property behind the museum? We have a soft property there as well. Is that the same? Is there another one we can attach it to? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that idea where you can densify it further by rezoning to rental tenure. Because mm -hmm. I mean it again, it incentivizes the current property owner to explore that option. Right. Okay, the next topic that we have then is accessory dwelling units. And we've talked about these before through the OCP process as well. But for a, a recap on what the, what they look like and what they can be, so we, we usually hear there's lots of different terms going on out there about accessory dwelling units. Uh, so sometimes people refer to them as secondary suites. Most commonly, when someone says secondary suite, they're referring to a suite that's in your basement or also in the, in the garage as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's carriage and laneway homes, which are all sometimes called garden suites, and so those are usually detached units that are in the backyard. Uh, and then there's also walk-off units, and so a walk-off unit is something that you would see in a multifamily um development where they've taken an apartment and then they uh divvied up a chunk of that where they've created another type of uh, suite um and it's usually quite small and so that was something that we brought up as part of the housing needs um report and the option that could be explored they're not as common um but they are gaining some more popularity in larger places uh like vancouver Per se. So can you explain that a little more? What do you mean a lock-off suite? It's it's part of the one suite, but you can unlock it and rent it out. So it would be part of a multi-family um unit, like an apartment unit, um, that's then has like another unit attached to it, essentially. And yeah, it's gonna be locked off. You can keep it rented out for the long term. Um, it could be a short-term rental as well. There's different options for how you can use them, but essentially it's creating another form of housing within an apartment type building. So I'm assuming that Interior Health would have to okay all of this because there would have to be, they'd have to meet the, those regulations no matter what type of unit you have, right? And yeah. building code regulations. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> 
And yeah. they're both parking, sorry. <laughs> parking. You can impose additional parking requirements for any of these types of units that we have left on the slide. Well, which is very common. I think we need to look at them for sure. If putting it yeah, I was going to say, I, I can support the character of Lane Homes. I'm just curious, how do you differentiate them from being short rental units? Would be my main concern. We will get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, so, here in town makes sense because we have a few lanes here. Yeah. We would accommodate them. And I think that's a great idea for the laneway home or carriage home go. Mm -hmm. But my concern is short term rental. Yeah. We will discuss short term rentals in the in the next little piece. Probably um, a lot. Yeah, probably a lot. <laughs> uh, but let's focus on accessory dwelling units for now. So if we go to the next slide, I also just wanted to provide you some context on what the OCP said. Oh, yeah. Can I mention that um, I know that you brought up before small homes, I think called tiny homes. Oh, yes. Are tiny. those yes, that's, kind of involved in this? That could be too. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for mentioning okay. tiny homes. Those are another uh, option that some communities are exploring us. Uh, yes. Like a detached type of accessory dwelling unit too. It was brought up at UBCM last year and it was passed that yep. you know, people yep. wanted to, tiny homes. Uh, to look at that. But of course, building regulations and you know all of those things have to be followed for sure thanks absolutely yeah. and another note on tiny homes as well i are seeing some communities exploring is things like tiny home parks so similar mm -hmm. to like a manufactured home park you have a a lot that's going to be up to allow just for tiny homes too um but again you know you have to have the space to allow for that mm -hmm. so that's something that we could um consider uh, as well if it's of interest in the council um, but I just want to give you some context on what the OCP says right now about accessory dwelling units, since this was a topic. Oh, oh just our back of <laughs> This was a topic that came up when we were doing the OCP. So in the housing in our neighborhood section, um, there's discussion about encouraging a mix of housing types and secondary dwelling units in small homes. Are two of the housing types mentioned in there? Um, there's also direction in the housing in our neighborhood section of the OCP that says to amend the zoning bylaw to permit carriage homes uh, as a type of secondary dwelling unit and to also permit one secondary dwelling unit per lot in the AG, R1, R2, R3, R6, R7, and R7A zones. And so if you go to the next slide, then you'll see where all those areas are in the community. So anything that's colored on this map is an area that was identified by council during the OCP update to permit at least one accessory dwelling unit per lot. I just said, I, this kind of includes the airport land, so we're talking about putting a, a home on there. They're not colored, pardon me. Yeah, the, the airport's thing. colored in yellow. Okay. Uh, that's that's I'm not... It's it's not the, the yellow area. Oh, that's there. back right there. Okay. Yeah. So then we go to the next slide. So can I ask why yes. did we include R two in this? I'm confused because that's the small the small lot. Certainly there wouldn't be enough room there in any of the small lots that I've seen to include a secondary. We currently allow a secondary suite in the zoning by in R three zone. Oh. It, yes, a secondary dwelling. So, yeah. in other words, as part of the house, yes. but not a secondary no. building. No, okay, right. sorry. Thanks. So, then in the low density residential section of the OCP, there's similar language in there to permit uh, a variety of housing types, uh, including secondary dwelling units, uh, encouraging secondary dwelling units as a form of infill housing, and then also to specifically for properties that are within the low density residential designation to permit one secondary dwelling unit per lot for the R1, R2, and R3 zones, which uh, is aligned with the direction that's provided in the housing and neighborhood section of the OCP. And so then if we go to the next slide, you'll see that these are the areas with R1, R2, and R3 zoning. So if we go to the next slide, our question for council is, are you okay with having one secondary dwelling unit per lot on any of these lands that are shown in color on the map? And if you are, what, what do you want that to look like? Because there's some, there's different options here. Um, 
just because the OCP says one accessory dwelling unit for a lot doesn't mean that we can't go beyond that if you think it's appropriate in some instances for someone to perhaps have a basement suite and a detached unit like a carriage home or a tiny home in their yard we can uh, allow that in certain zones of the community um, if you think that it's not appropriate to have any suites or carriage homes anywhere we can also be restrictive in where we decide to permit them so we're seeking council's direction on how we want to move forward with this <laughs> Tricky one, isn't it? Um, I I don't see a problem with having um, secondary dwellings or carriage homes, but I I do think we need to look maybe at each as an individual. Um, I don't know how we can just say yes, you can have it in all the in this zone uh, and include everybody because there could be different sizes of lots, different sizes of homes, right. different. Is that a concern? Or well, not? thank you, Mayor McCarthy. So just for clarity, you could limit, um, say, for example, a carriage home or a cottage on, right? So that as, a, as that third um, yes. accessory dwelling unit on properties of a certain size. Yes. Or, for example, for carriage homes, you might limit them only to properties that have, an, have access to the carriage home independent of the access to the primary residence, whether that's by a laneway or by another alley or another um, um, driveway that goes directly to the rear of the property. So there's, there are different techniques mm -hmm. uh, to limit it. Um, so that um, say, for example, a tenant is in your carriage home, they're not, they're always able to get to their residence, right. for example. Right. Um, there's different ways of doing it that you could. So, I mean, at this point, we're just wondering, is council wanting us to explore this, um, say the idea of a, an additional accessory dwelling um, on properties? And then I'm gonna throw one more wrench into it. Mm -hmm. And that is, what about short-term rentals? So, Let's peel back that way. Um, I just have a question for uh, Director Brownstein. If we do go ahead with this, how would that impact infrastructure? And great question. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, we can allow it, but and then my secondary question would be to to Corey if he's because um, I can already feel his blood pressure increase. With, uh, <laughs> A mention of sure. um, so fire safety and infrastructure, but I think infrastructure should. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> so through the chair of council, Tron, um, depending on the densities that you're proposing in these zones, yes, there's going to be impact from water washes to better sanitary systems. But what those impacts look like, I can't tell you right now. Mm -hmm. um, as with any development, there's they need water, they need sewer. So you're completely correct that as densities increase, there's going to be infrastructure upgrades that come along with that. Um, I you know I keep on singing the tune that so you're going to have to wait for my water master plan in order for me to provide you with better guidance. But um, it, density throughout the community is probably not your best strategy. Uh, I would pick particular areas in the community you want to see high density. And focus in on those areas and provide that density in, in key locations instead of trying to densify your entire community. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're downtown core is what I would consider what most buildings value is because they don't densify their downtown core. So mm -hmm. instead of you know one lot, uh, single family residents, they're knocking down 10 or 12 homes and they're putting in a four or five story apartment complex, which Corey's now going to go and go to, but yeah. um. That's the kind of you know long term vision that I think the OCP mm -hmm. was related to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if I may, thank you very much, Jared. Mm -hmm. Just one additional comment to to Jared's there is that in the current zoning bylaw, it states that if you have, for example, if you're a small lot in R seven zone, you can build it out to the densities identified for that zone, even though you might not meet the minimum zone lot size requirements 
because that minimum lot size requirement is there for the creation of new zones. In some communities, that number, the minimum lot size would say something like, say for example, in R7, your property needs to be a minimum of 2,000 square meters in size to be able to exercise the option of having a multifamily development on it. So that encourages the um, consolidation of lots. That's what Mr. Brownstein is talking about. Okay, can I please go to uh, Chief Courtmeyer? Go ahead, please. Um, thank you and good uh, good afternoon, everyone. The densities um, that are impacted, even with uh, a bit of snow removal and how it pushes um, some distance from the sidewalks out into the um, the traveling lanes does have a, a direct impact for our emergency services to gain access to certain areas and and um, and leave certain areas depending on the densities of of the parking. So that um, can be impacted by snow removal. And then during peak times where you know there are uh, parts of our community that would be um, that would potentially have higher parking rates just because of short-term rentals or Airbnb, you can notice the difference in the swelling um, of June to September, for example. <laughs> And gaining access to some of these areas and egress from the, some of these areas can be a challenge from a, the emergency services point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, they're all tricky, aren't they? <laughs> Hello. Okay, Somebody, Gerald. Camera on. Jim. Um, I'm I not sure. Jim's talking on the phone. Who's the camera? I'm moving them. Mr. Zackel, can you turn your... Uh, you you Good, thanks. Mm. It'll be a long year. So, yeah. Um, are we still looking at this? Because it's obviously a tricky one. We're going to have to think more on this one. Mm -hmm. think, we? It's not an easy answer. No so, problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can also go with the pilot project approach where we identify certain zones which we allow accessory dwelling units and then see how those perform. Mm -hmm. We pretty much allow them in all zones right now. Then, then why are you asking? We're asking about an additional <laughs> accessory. No, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. if, we can, yeah. if we allow, for example, if we allow additional accessory dwelling units in agriculture with AG and, and R1 zones only for now. I see. And yeah. And then see how they perform, see what the strain is on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. So to, to, to further to that point, I mean, you've got areas around 89, 87 in the mm -hmm. backyard out. Mm -hmm. uh, very conducive to allow for carriage homes, yes. etc. Mm -hmm. within those year development zones. So again, the the, the echo your need for the pilot program mm -hmm. in your area. Yeah. Uh, you've got an exhibit you have to show you know, for that additional mm -hmm. capacity. Okay. Um, you start looking at dividend rates, you start looking at other areas of the community where you have to buy certain houses. Yeah. Either you're gonna have a sea of driveways or you're gonna have people parking everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So maybe why like, we can identify special zones. Not like zone zone, but different areas where you can look at the pilot project to yeah. see how it goes, and then from there, if yeah. there's a negative impact, we limit the negative outcomes. Right. So if I may, yeah, the yeah. mayor, thank you, Councillor Chong. What I was going to suggest is you could say <clears throat> something to the effect of, and again, it's just something to the effect of carriage homes may be permitted on properties of X size or larger, where access to that new carriage home or or layway house or whatever you're going to use cottage it can be done so by a layway. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, public land. Land. I mean, there is, yeah, there, there's, there's language we can put in there when we <clears throat> explore it further. Is there a way that I mean, when we're redoing maps that there could be a map done showing those mm -hmm. types of, um, of you know where that possibly could go? Uh, places where there would be, we already know there's a back, a laneway there. It might 
help to have that in different color and just look at you know things. So are we in agreement? Maybe mm -hmm. that's our mm -hmm. approach. I think that's yeah, a good one. Yeah. It's a good approach to yeah. ask by the public. In terms of lot size that you want to look at, then if you go to the next slide, this was going to be a question that we asked. You know, all the lot sizes that you have for all of your uh, zones where the OSP provides direction to permit a secondary dwelling unit. So, thinking about lot sizes then for this pilot program, which are which sort of zones do you want to focus this on or? Is a lot are the lot sizes that are here um, within each of the zones? Are they appropriate? Do we do we want to pick a different lot size for what we're looking at here? I think it's more beneficial if it's on the lane that it's accessible, say by a fire truck, it would be more important in the size. I, I don't think lot size or minimum lot size is the right metric because it doesn't identify whether it's accessible by emergency services or parking needs. I mean, if that, that is my opinion. And you've also got to look at the ability to put in water and sewer, because that would have to be added, wouldn't it, mm -hmm. to each each of those properties. So that maybe needs to be looked at too. Um, comes the, those are very good points. I can say there are no R2 zones that have alleys. Okay, right away, I, I know that to be true. The only places where there are alleys are island zones. Mm -hmm. That would be the first yeah, yeah, that's the project. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are all minimum 616 supply mm -hmm. square meters. But again, you could also have provisions around lot size and distance between existing home and accessory dwelling mm -hmm. at home, dwelling unit. And, there's lots of different ways to go all of those oh, regulated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. We will just look at R1 for now then. Sure. We'll throw AG into there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, AG too. And just so you know, if the property is in the agricultural land reserve, it has special special allowances to have extra dwelling units on it. Yeah. Okay, short term rentals now, our favorite topic. <laughs> um, so, in context on what the OTP says about them, uh, basically, it's telling us we should consider establishing a policy. Right? Okay. Like, so, that's what that's what we are doing. Um, and then also um, a permitting process as well to regulate them. And so that's that's the intent of this exercise. So we can go to the next slide then. So the RUS is has a survey out right now about um short term rents. I haven't filled it in yet, but I know I've I've got a little bit of time, but I'm assuming it is just for the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Am I correct mm -hmm. in that one? Yeah. Okay. What would be your thought if we didn't make a policy and we just open it up to everybody so it's a level playing field for everybody for short term rentals? Just permit them everywhere? Yeah. Well, you could. Well, Is that what Capital wants to do? Well, I'm not saying I'm just throwing that on the table okay. as an option <laughs> because it, it goes down to enforcement and we don't have enough manpower to enforce and then to write tickets and then to chase the money. There's a big expense mm -hmm. attached to this policy. So I'm just throwing something different out there. Hmm. It would be bedlam. Yeah, yeah, it would. It, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't have to worry about thank it. you, Kelsey. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I think about. we would have to worry. <laughs> um, I think you're going to consider, and again, um, the direct directive to the consultants is to come up with recommendations yeah. to, on a program that we would then consider implementing. So what I would suggest is you think about things like do you think short-term rentals should be permitted in a multifamily development? No. That's not everywhere then. Yeah. Do you think that short-term rentals should be permitted in intensive residential zones like Millark? No. 
Well, because there probably is not enough parking, and that's one of the big ones, eh? There's th these are the questions, and so I think that when you're considering it, you need to think about what criteria under which you would want to see them um, exist, and how many. <clears throat> what is the maximum number of guests that could be, be permitted? Should, Should they be... I micromanage that though? I mean, it's um, a silly it, question. Well, in other communities, it's done through a permitting process. So, for example, in uh, the city of Penticton, if you want to have a short term rental, you have to go and apply. And then you have a building inspector come and inspect your home for a fee, just make sure that it's safe, those permitted use. They dictate how many people you're allowed to have in that unit. They make sure that you have the appropriate parking. Um, and once you've had all your inspections, et cetera, and you're charged appropriate fees to cover things like extra servicing costs, you're you're given a sticker to place in your window. Oh, I understand all so, that question. So that's how it's regulated. It's just the amount of people mm -hmm. like I could apply for four or six of them. You're not your, your neighbors felt regulated, seriously. So <clears throat> let's just say that I opened up an Airbnb in my new house, which I don't know where that is. Mm -hmm. Um and I have a sticker in the window that says I'm allowed to have five people in there, and there's carloads and carloads and carloads of people showing up all the time. You can bet the neighbors are going to call. But that takes time, too, of course, mm -hmm. as we know, yeah. because, you know, the neighbors can phone and complain and they can take pictures, and, and then that starts the process. So we're right. really better off to try and limit that problem right, right away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor McCarthy. And that's what I mean by if you have a limit, you're already telling that person they're allowed to have an Airbnb under certain conditions. It's not like now we have to prove that they're operating an Airbnb, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a little different, right? Um, but there are a lot, you know, you, you can't be a carte blanche kind of approach either, right? And so, uh, one more quick thing, in some communities, where you allow an Airbnb in, in say, a basement suite or, or the upper floor, right? Either way, um, the other unit has to be occupied full time by either a tenant or the owner. It, they can't Airbnb both. I mean, just saying, yeah. these, are, these are tried and true examples. That one is being done in Vernon and Squamish, um, for example, and they limit the number of them throughout the community too. But we have, we can get a license for a B and B, correct? In certain areas right now. Yes, but a B and B is entirely within your home. Yeah, it's not a separate unit. No, I, I agree. Yes, that's right now, right? Correct. Up to three bedrooms. Yeah. And we're talking short term. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Councilor Jane, you have to speak in. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> you guys on the on the on, on, the, on the, yeah. On this slide, we do have a list of all the potential things that you can consider regulating. Um, we just wanted to also ask the question of where do you want these in the community? And so when Gina asked the question, do we want them in multifamily? No. Do we want them in the of residential? No. That's giving us an inkling towards what you're thinking. Um, so we want you to consider all of these possible options for regulation, but then also, is there anywhere else in the community where you don't want to see them? Uh, because that's something we will need to decide or ask the community and let them decide. So for this list, Gina stated a few of them. So um, typically, if we see them permitted in the zoning bylaw, they're permitted as an accessory use, not as the principal thing happening on the property. Um, Sometimes we see a maximum number of short-term rentals that you can have per property. Um, sometimes we see them limited to being permitted in the accessory dwelling unit only, so, so the basement suite or the carriage home or the garage suite only. Or sometimes we also see them being limited to be, being permitted in the house itself only. Uh, it's just a matter of preference for that community. As uh, Gina mentioned, sometimes the owner or a person who's designated uh, to act on the own behalf, must be present on the property at all times for the SPR to be in operation. Most often there's a business license or some sort of permit that's required. Um, you can limit the number of 
guests that you can have in the unit at any time. You can require insurance. You can go through a process where you must notify the neighbors or people within a certain radius that the uh, permit has been uh, sought and seek their feedback. And there could be a whole uh, public consultation process assorted with that, associated with that. Um, you can also restrict the rental to being uh, used for a maximum number of nights. So each day would be limited, um, usually 30 days is the maximum that we see. Sometimes we see two weeks as well. Uh, and then also you can require additional parking too. So there's a whole range of things to consider when it comes to regulating these. And just briefly, one other one I've just seen recently is the minimum number of nights. Mm -hmm. So that you're not seeing people change every yeah. two days. So say, for example, that it might be four night minimum, I'm just saying. And so do some of these things get um, looked at if you have a business license and a permit? Would that not... Um, I know that there's that they're all important, but to me that's the most important. And proof of insurance. I, I think that's another one because you've got 10 people in your house. Um what does that do to your water and sewer? That's the other thought. But you know what? If you have insurance for that, then at least um you know that that's what's going on there. And I, I think part of the problem is it says require owner or designate to be present on the property. That's a hard one to to manage because how are you going to prove that without going up knocking on the door and giving you know making sure that they have so I don't yeah I mean I I agree with that but I I'm not sure how easy, easy it is to monitor I think uh, enforceability is going to be key here because right. there's certain things that are just not feasible like maximum number of nights it's it's going to be incredibly difficult to to manage everyone. I mean spot checks with like requirement of owner or that to be present on the property like even just a threat of spot checks might yeah. be enough um I think the idea of a special permit is is a step in the right direction because then from there you can have those inspection um and then safety inspections um and then proof of insurance as well and uh and then the only way the permit can be given is maybe if, if they check all the boxes with parking space yeah. as well. Absolutely. And that's exactly where the direction that I would recommend that we consider going if we're going to go down this road. Um, the other thing is, too, is that you have to renew your license and your permit every year. Mm -hmm. And that's a fee. So this would be cost recovery. We would make money off of it. We would recover costs mm -hmm. for inspection. So just because you know you were inspected the first time you opened it, you only had two bedrooms, <clears throat> for example, needs to be reinspected by the building inspector prior to issuance of your new permit for the new year. Um, so that would be a cost recovery amount too. Don't forget that a lot of these are renting for three and four and five hundred dollars a night and so on. Yeah. So no one should be complaining that they had to spend three hundred dollars to have a building inspector mm -hmm. come up in advance of them renewing their permit. Um, and and. Um, when someone's issued a permit, we could identify something, and again, it's just all open for conversation. Um, if we received, you know, three or more complaints over the last year, then you're not allowed to have a permit, a renewed permit for in, the next year. Mm -hmm. Again, these are just, you know, um, and these are examples that have been tried and true in other communities, and it's worked. Good. Um, I'm not discounting the possibility of making the price of the permit almost not completely cost prohibitive, but as you said, like a lot of the Airbnbs are going three hundred, five hundred dollars a night. I mean, they're able to pay for the prop, but the mortgage in like two months, right? So, not to, of course, gouge your residents in any way, shape, or form, but at the same time, it's the running a business and. I think it's it's an opportunity. It's I just want to put that on the table where we maybe make the permit a little bit higher, and that way it's uh, it does give us the opportunity to, for example, add more into Director Brownstein's fund for Director or other people, etc. 
Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to do that. When we create the uh, fees and permits, and, uh, they have to be justifiable to uh, the public on why they're charging those fees. So we can't inflate the fee uh, to put more money into Director Bronstein's budget. However, <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. However, um, if we would need to ensure that the fee or the permit um, we're covering all costs that is okay, but we couldn't just per se that every uh, short term <laughs> rental is going to pay us five thousand dollars unless we had the backup on how we came to that five thousand um, dollars. So there there are certain limitations for create fees or um, that they have to be justifiable. So maybe that's something we bring to the public what they believe is a justifiable price for a permit. We can also look at how much other communities are costing up for their yeah. permit fees as well. Sure. So most people, when you explain to them, well, most, let's say 80, 90 percent, uh, uh, that why we're putting in uh, a, a business license or a fee that's required, and here's what, here's why we're doing this, most of them won't comply. Is what we found once once we've gone to them so and said, well, yeah, it's the five or ten percent that uh, take all of our time and our bylaw officers' time, and um, that will try and find a way to um, to get around it. So those unfortunately take way more of our time. Most people mm -hmm. would understand that this is a good thing for them as long as they follow the rules. Go ahead. I think you're just, just, just suggesting suggestion to council I'm going back to council terms the reading won't go with um, your carriage homes and other things. But again, you look at a pilot area for this as well. So you can kind of get an understanding of how much this is actually going to cost the municipality, how much manpower this is going to involve in from us from planning perspective, yeah. from bylaw perspective, yeah. etc. And we need to come back and visit it in three years, two years, whatever you choose mm -hmm. is an appropriate time frame. But at least then you've got a you're able to make an informed decision on the mm -hmm. impacts of this and so to just build on on director brownstein's comment um you might want to do a first come first serve approach as well as has been done in squamish did this for example um we're going to do a pilot project with 100 short-term rentals whatever level that is that you want to look at and you have to pay the fee to have the inspection to meet the needs, comply with building code, comply with um, you know parking, access, egress, all that kind of stuff um, before you get your permit. And the first whatever number that comply are the ones that get a permit for that first year. I mean, just an idea yeah. that has been done in other communities. So okay. Ms. McKay, can I have temporary use permits, which are fairly common to deal with at the RDOS? Is that is that just in the rural area or is that in towns as well? That is a nightmare to, yeah. <laughs> to manage and time commitment beyond yeah. belief. Yeah. Because we right now have between three and five hundred, three hundred to five hundred short term rentals operating at any given time. Yes. So a temporary use permit is just a way of dealing with it. That is, that would be yeah. you deal yeah would be much much more time consuming. Okay, good thanks. Okay. And what's your timeline to implement all this? Well, the scope of work for the project is to come up with recommendations. Yes. For implementation. <laughs> so, in terms of implementation, that's up to council to decide. So. Two twenty four. Yeah. That and at the at the earliest. Well, what I would think would happen is once we start to see the direction that council wants to go, we could um, take this particular project and work on it a little bit more in in depth in the department, um, and and come up with say a program or ideas about a program, um, and sort of branch it off from the completion of the zoning mm -hmm. bylaw if that was council's wish. Um, well, I guess I go back to we're looking at about eight or nine things, but we prioritized three of them, and this is one of them. So that would be right. looked at, say, first. 
Well, we're going to do the public consultation yeah, from that, that which isn't going to finish until the fall. So, um, yes, but after that. But what I'm suggesting is we take this opportunity as a learning opportunity as well for the public, for those persons out there that are operating them unlawfully right now. And hopefully they'll pull back on some of those operations. Um, we've also been proactively looking for and sending out letters to those persons operating them, not necessarily that we, ones that we've received a complaint about. And our purpose of doing that in the department is to bring it to their intention, attention that we recognize that they're doing something that's unlawful. And there's a process coming up. Please come out and participate in the process. I think that's a good way to do it. Use a communication campaign. So mm -hmm. And, ex and uh, appreciate the fact that if they do the right thing, um, that's a positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, are we in agreement with the pilot project? Sure. Let's try it. We can, yeah, we can. Follow up questions on the pilot project. Do we want to pilot that this within the same areas as for many accessory dwelling units? Um, I don't think they necessarily they just for clarity. I mean, I think what we're trying to achieve at this particular juncture is the topics of that council wants us to discuss with the community mm -hmm. so that we would then discuss with the community. Um, you mm -hmm. know, this is what we're thinking of doing is having a pilot project around these different, and, um, yeah, get there. Let's hope there's enough people from the public that will um, oh, be involved in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. No, that yeah. sounds good. So our final topic for today then is the foreshore and lake zoning bylaw. Uh, And so there are a number of areas along the foreshore that the town has leases on um, that have private uh, uses on them. And so Gina is going to speak to this, but on the slides, it shows some of these examples right. of these areas. So I'll turn it over to you, Gina, to drop and drive first. Okay, so thanks, Brittany. So what happened in 2012 was the town was successful in obtaining a number of foreshore leases over areas where either it was public parkland or where we had a road, either built road or unbuilt road allowance. So in this particular example, we have an unbuilt road allowance along Jasmine Drive. And so this is the um, area that we've looked at having what we call the Acacia Trail connecting to the um, provincial park, the Suez Park. And so um, this particular area was identified in the foreshore bylaw as an area where those upland property owners, which were called semi-waterfront property owners, could apply to the town to have a dock facility. Well, unfortunately, there are no, there's no method uh, that we can implement to allow these people to apply to us for a dock facility. The only thing we could do is take a head lease rather than have this particular foreshore lease. So that's one example. Brittany, I'm not sure which other slide you have there. Um, oh, here's well, a good one. Here's one of my favorites. And then away from that is fine. Right. So these particular, and I can pass this book around because um, they're quite detailed. Um, here's an example for you. Um, this particular area, if you just want to pass this down, Councillor Chong, and you can see where I'm pointing to this area on the map, which is this Walton's right there. Um, so what's happened is along here, for example, this is actually public beach from Walton's um, down to Oasis um, property is actually public beach all along there. And as you know, there's a proliferation of, of uh, buoys Etc. And of course, Walton's also puts up swim grades. Now, these particular leases were um, due to expire in 2022. Um, however, I have managed to have the Crown uh, agree to extend them as they are um, for two, two additional years. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. Um, to expend, extend them for two more years while we have this conversation with the community and think about options that what we might want to do in these areas. And the reason that this is important is because in the lease itself that we have, we have agreed to. Um, <laughs> this is pretty, pretty tricky here. We've actually agreed to not allow anyone to construct, place, anchor, secure, affix anything on or in the land, et cetera, et cetera. So we are actually in contravention of our agreement with the province by not addressing this issue. Um, the, <clears throat> the province has agreed to extend the leases on the basis that we're exploring the the opportunity to come to some sort of agreement with the community of how we want to look to the toward um, possibly having them. Um, um, we talked briefly before about a buoy lease program, whereby we would have to identify the carrying capacity of certain areas, like maybe some areas have the capacity to have 15 boats, some may have 30. I don't, I don't know that's not on an area of expertise, but um, it's an option that we could consider. Um, again, I think what we need to do as part of this process and talking about the four core um, zoning bylaw is talk about um, lake, lake health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uses on the lake, as Mayor McCorda pointed out earlier, safety on the lake. Um, you know, maybe there's areas that we want to approach the federal government about having limited um, speeds. On the area of the lake, a lot of people talk about the the basin area just past the bridge, like basically from here, from um, from Lions Park across to OIB land, sort of that area in there, having a speed limit. I mean, these are these are some of the conversations that we should probably think about having with the community. I just want to bring your attention to the lease situation, and you know, we have been I'm aware that. Um, they're close to expiring, and as I say, they've they've granted an extension while we have this conversation with the community explore explore some possible opportunities. So. What happens if um the, they don't extend that lease in two years? Well, that would be unfortunate because we would have no sort of control over these areas. Now that would re that would be quite disastrous actually I, there is no reason for them not to extend them they're hoping um, they will extend them as they are for another 10 years but they're wondering if we wouldn't like to get a better grip on the situation through some sort of regulatory process so if, with the absence of a regulatory process there's a possibility that they would not be quite amenable to renew the lease it's not going to get better is basically the way best way to phrase it. It's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And the monitoring it is another big problem because we know that there are people that will go up in front of a private residence and assume that they can mm -hmm. drop a, an anchor there and put their boat there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm, I'm not sure how we ever get a handle on that one, how we, we deal with that. But I, I do think we need to have something in place mm -hmm. so i'm mm -hmm. totally in agreement mainly for safety all we need to do is have well look at how many accidents we have had yeah. not necessarily on the shore but there could be if there are swimming areas and then people with boats and that type of thing coming in so we we need to address it and i think we need to to be um to have a really hard look at some areas where there are multiple family units mm -hmm. that have for shore rights themselves, but have mm -hmm. not gone and built the marina, which they are actually required to do through the province of British Columbia. They are supposed to build a proper marina facility, not just throw a bunch of buildings in the lake. Yeah. So we, we're not going to be very popular, but um, you know, there's a lot of safety issues um, associated with all the boats that are mm -hmm. piling up, so to speak. What about the ones that have docks in front of them? Now we're kind of pushing over to buoys because they're all over the place and kind of, but a few of these have docks already? Or, so, know, um, to what area would you be referring well, to? Well, I'll just say, so 
the Oasis Resort looks like this dog in front of the sand. That's, that's a good question. That dock is actually in front of Townland. Yeah. Um, their property doesn't start to get further to the south. So that that is the dock that's in our leased area. Um, the area that they own is directly across from you see the pink dot that shows the yeah, the oasis. They own the area just across the, the 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 road from there and then a little bit up. But um, you can see the boat launch. Yeah, the boat launch is on town property. Mm. So that that's a, an excellent area where we could um, instruct them to start working with the crown to have their own dock facility so that area became public beach, which is what it is supposed to be. Yeah. So we want each of these um, Waltons and Oasis to deal with the crown, not with not us. Waltons, Waltons does not have any foreshore okay. land. Thank you. They would be a good candidate for a booty lease program. But then you raise the question, should it only be Waltons that's allowed to rent a buoy from us in that foreshore area? Or should somebody on Chardonnay Court have just as much right? Or um, it's a big kind of words. Yes, because lots more and more people mm -hmm. and whatever the the water slide, you know, property. They wanted to have mm -hmm. something, and I don't think they have anything in front, do they, right now? They have, no. So that was a concern because I remember the owner of that, the developer, was, had already bought a boat and he wanted to know where to put it. Um, yeah. So uh, there yeah. are there are strategies, I mean, say like Island View, that's actively um, working with the province around some sort of dog food facility. Okay. So there are. Could we suggest that to others, but depending mm -hmm. on what they've got in front of their, you know. I hear you correctly, though. Like, I go back to Jasmine's right now, the couple docks there. Uh, they could actually apply to the province and try to get 10 years, and we'd have to leave them there. No, because we have a foreshore lease over that area, they cannot obtain a foreshore lease over that area. We could apply for um, a lease, which is a head lease, it's called. Right. And then within that program, we could then um, lease out um, basically the same thing we've done with the Wibbit. So we took a head lease over that for shore area to allow that commercial use. Um, so then we would have to charge them accordingly to cover that cost of that head lease. So is there any thought of removing these two dogs? There's more than two, but there's tons down there. Um, well, I just have your picture. There's two that um, yeah, it's an older, but yeah. I've got too long quite often. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was, yeah. I know it was very controversial during the yes. more short lake zoning ballot conversation, so it was. Well, plus, I mean, the one was identified actually an OBN line. I think that's going to pull out of the water. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. And part of it, um, I met Sarah Boyle down there one day mm -hmm. when I was walking because she mm -hmm. was putting um, some of the parks. It had extended further north than they originally thought. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I was on that committee in 2012, and I do know that that um, this area, Jasmine Drive, was a. It took a lot of time. We had a lot of people here in the mm -hmm. audience when we were talking about that. Yeah. I think we should all be prepared for the questions regarding another marina, public marina facility. Mm -hmm. We should just be prepared for those conversations at the public meetings, which we know there are no answers. This can circle back to where are we mm -hmm. going to put the boat trailers and where are we going to put the cars and what I mean. And is there a place in the town's jurisdiction that we could put another marina if we thought it should go in? There's no place that you could put a marina that would have the parking mm -hmm. that you need to go with the marina. So there used to be a marina. Um, I think Director Davis has a question, but there used to be one in front of Oasis, but a uh, big marina there at one point. Mm -hmm. 
Director Davis, do you have um, something you'd like to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the just one comment uh, in relation to what we have with our marina is also um, the use or the ability to fill up or gas on the lake because we only have one. And I'm not sure where that fits in or how that would be applicable to that, uh, but just, just wanted to make that comment. Mm -hmm. And is that not down at Newton Beach? Is that where they get Starlight? Starlight. 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 Sorry, there used to be one down at uh, at Region Beach too at the um, Safari so uh, Beach. That's not there now. Okay. So <laughs> we're <laughs> we're running out of land. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty much, right? I mean, it's interesting because I did have a developer approach me about a specific property in town and asked about building one of those facilities that you see on in West Kelowna where oh. they've got the boat elevators and they, you know, um, so there has been some oh. conversation about that. Um, so you take your boat down, you launch your boat, then you take your trailer back and put it in your storage. Then where would you stop, park your boat on the lake? while you're using your boat for the two months you're here at your summer place or mm -hmm. while you're renting a place. I don't know the answers. Yeah. Is there just more and more. Is there another or there other municipalities that are dealing with this and could we look at what they're doing? Um, I'm wondering about uh sickness. They seem to have I think they're on the river, not on the lake, but they have a lot of facilities up there and I don't know what so interestingly enough I also lived in Sycamore oh did you <laughs> 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 um I worked for the Columbia Shushot Regional District and I did Sycamore and worked mm -hmm. kind of seminar mm -hmm. so watching what was happening around that lake and the Sycamore area as well it was very interesting mm -hmm. um they have a lot more land I know they do and that pretty much you know That's is what, it yeah they make a lot of money on storage facilities up there. They yeah. they do, and they have a lot of boat storage facilities yes. there, yeah. Ricardo. Yeah. They also um they have lots <laughs> of where is the park? They just have a lot more room. So, so uh Director Davis, your hand is still up. Did you have something else to include? Uh yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh Cultus Lake has a um, very similar uh program, and as far as I know, it actually works very well. Um but as part of being a resort municipality, we did make a trip one time to Harrison Hot Springs. Um, and uh, getting back to Councillor Chong's um, comment about a resort municipality and uh, charging, um, people who used their, um, you know, their boat launches were charged like $10 every time to use it. Um, and we don't charge anything to do with stuff like that. So just, just another option. Hmm. Thank you. That's actually becoming quite popular now to charge for bunk launches. It's not uncommon. And just to clarify also, um, a thank you very much, Director Davis. Um, Colby's Lake has a buoy lease program. Mm. So if you like, I could send so you all copies of that program. Mm -hmm. to look at. I think we better look at it. Yeah. I think we should consider a buoy mm -hmm. lease program. And it doesn't have to be something implemented right away. It could be something that's done in stages, so it's not overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Just another suggestion. Um, Booty lease program would be considered to be a short-term solution. Mm -hmm. uh, do you need a long-term vision of dealing with water graph on this day? So if that is in your arena, that would be mine. Mm -hmm. And how you're going to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, just to keep you moving on the, the right path, uh, buoys are great, but they're not going to be your yeah. ultimate yeah. solution to this problem. Um, absolutely. So when I first moved here, and that was back in the you know, dark ages, they we had um, those boats, those, what do they call those ones? The really high-powered, noisy boats. They, the uh, well, so yeah, they those types of things. There were races here mm -hmm. every May 24th weekend until it was decided that that was not a good idea and it was mm -hmm. and, and they they just banned it mm -hmm. so it was very easy to do i think 
we've had certainly people say to to me to the town that um they think that we should not even have power boats on the lake it should just be you know canoes and i mean jet skis are uh, or jet boats are um are noisy and certainly in the summertime isn't it interesting that i've lived here that long that that on on um, labor day weekend everybody sort of breathes a sigh of relief because things are quieter and that's because of the boats that are out there now i know that you can't say no power boats but you know what <laughs> you can't well the problem is that we have too many jurisdictions on our lake i mean we can only control what we can do on in on on townland but we've got you know area a we've got the oib and we've got the well you can't go across the border now you used to be able to um you know in town washington so i think it might be tricky to do that but definitely it's been many many years that we've talked about all of these things now Okay, so we're going to look at those, eh? <laughs> Short term, long term solutions. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at that for the okay. for today. So now we'll wrap up. Yeah, we're right on time. It's great. Okay, good. Um, so our next steps then are getting some questions sorted for the public engagement, which is coming up pretty quickly here. It's hard to believe at the end of January yeah. already, but we're going to be launching the website, which will be a citiesdoningupdate.ca on Monday, February 13th. And we'll have a survey that's ready to go for that launch as well. And the survey will run until March 13th. And between those times, um, we're going to have two uh, in-person uh, meetings, one on Tuesday, February 28th, and the other on Saturday, March 11th, and they will be at the Sonora Center. Um, just, we had to change that Tuesday date. You know, we call it the March 1st. Oh, I'm sorry. Or the um, other no, one. It, it was a regular March 1st. Okay, so yeah. I know when it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so Tuesday, February 28th. So that would be in the evening because we have council meetings all day. In the yeah, yeah. Yes. These right. are both evening meetings. The Saturday will be during the afternoon. Okay. On Saturday, March 11th. Uh, that will be in the afternoon at the Sonora Center. And then we also have an online um, evening meeting mm -hmm. on Tuesday, March 7th, for those who are unable to attend uh, in person. Okay. So it would be, we'd be in here. Yes, yeah, so I want to make sure that yeah. people that are not comfortable with going on um, on a website mm -hmm. have the opportunity to come in person or speak or fill in a form or something. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So the website would launch uh, February 13th, the Studio Snowing Update. Okay. <clears throat> and it would run for a month. And um, that will be advertised in various mm -hmm. methods. Mm -hmm. Um, and then again, as Brittany pointed out, we do have the what all the all the in person workshops are at the Sonora Center. Good, so we, we'll provide more details for those two at Sonora Center. We'll be sending calendar uh, yes. notices out. Yeah. So we'll be advertising in the e newsletter that goes out, um, in the newspaper, and then also through some social media channels as well. We're hoping to you know, ask this in the local radio. Yes, be a good one too. Yeah, find out as well. <laughs> Okay. okay. That's everything that we have. So for thank, today. You, thank you very much. You've got lots of notes there and lots of things that you have to, <laughs> we do. to look up. <laughs> Could we give um, Miss McKay some homework to do while she's sitting on the beach for the next two weeks? No, she said no. We cannot. <laughs> <laughs> we will do the homework while she's oh, away. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Director Davis and uh, Director Zappel for. Um, being online here. Um, anybody else have anything to um, to add before we terminate? Um, I think that's it. Okay, Councillor King, sure, terminating. Alfred <laughs> Chong is seconding that. All in favor.